You have talked about the importance of using practice as a guide to a, a, you know, for our politics. Um, and yet it seems as if the practice of American politics and the practices of our society have drifted off course uh, over the past, you know, not just 30 years, not just perhaps 60 years, but for quite a long time. When did this uh, sort of drift off course begin? And what caused it? Why, why did our practices go from being virtuous to being conducive to vice? Well, there are many people I'd like to blame. I'd like to blame the uh, second wave feminists. Before that, I'd like to blame the new left. Before that, I would like to blame uh, the critical theorists, say. Before that, I would like to blame, oh, I don't know, Martin Luther. Before that, I would like to blame, uh, I guess I could go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, which is when this problem really began. And the serpent told Eve, ye shall be as gods. So, uh, you know, I, I don't... Uh, and I, I, I'm only half joking. I mean, you know, you really could trace it all the way back. But, but there was this shift that happened in the 20th century, there's no question. And, and the shift really does, uh, to shift our focus for a moment from the Civil War to this broader question of the open society and, and the kind of na na fundamental nature of the American regime and when it changes, th this question of the open society was a big problem because you, you had the left pull a fast one, I think, in the middle of the 20th century. I think that the seeds of what we call now wokeness or political correctness or whatever, I think they were sown in the 20s and 30s, and I think they really flowered in, in the 1960s, and I think the second wave feminists did a bang up job on this in the 70s when they unsettled everything and said that the personal is political. I think they were right, I mean they were obviously right, when, when they would hold their there are what I refer to as wine and cheese soirees with an H after the W. The New York radical women's groups in New York would invite perfectly happy bourgeois housewives to show up to their little gatherings. And the happy housewives would leave furious at their state in the world. They had had their consciousness raised to recognize their own terrible oppression because they had to do the dishes or something. And, uh, and what they did very successfully by opening up everything from who does the dishes to who you know, watches the kids, when they, when they opened up everything to political scrutiny, that they unsettled all of the standards. And so today, the sneakers you wear are a political matter, and the chicken sandwich that you eat is a political matter. And I know that some conservatives want to return to the largely imagined era, you know, largely fantastical era where we, you know, Tip O'Neill would get a drink with Reagan at 6 p.m., which I think happened like once, and they hated each other. Uh, but, but, you know, there was a period where we could all agree a little bit more, and, but, but the standards were unsettled, and I think that the only way out is through. I think we're going to have to win those political battles and actually settle things, and that's going to involve, you know, a political organization. It won't just be winning hearts and minds, but it'll, it'll actually involve some sort of lobbying. Uh, Bill Buckley had this debate uh, in 1966 on Firing Line with uh, Leo Churn, and the question was, <laughs> I mentioned that I'm a McCarthyite because of Dan, the question was McCarthyism, past, present, and future, and I think this was horrifying to people who did not think McCarthyism had a future, uh, and, and this was 12 years, no, sorry, 14 years after Buckley wrote his defense of Joe McCarthy, McCarthy and his enemies, and uh, in the debate, Leo Churn said, Bill, the one thing that we have to acknowledge is something that's so central to everything we hold dear is the open society. It's the name of uh, George Soros's foundation, by the way, just to give you a sense of where this idea comes from. And uh, he says, the open society is what matters to us. And Buckley said, no, no, I, I do not think the society should be any more open. I think it ought to be a lot more closed. I am, and then he used this very Buckley-esque phrase, he said, I am an epistemological optimist, by which I mean, I think we can know things. I think certain matters can be settled. I'm not advocating throwing Nazis and communists into prison, but I'm not saying we ought to keep them out either. That, that we actually not only can settle certain things and know certain things, but that we must. Inevitably, society is going to do that. And I think the, the fast one you saw pulled by the left in the middle of the 20th century is this idea that we need to, you know, the free speech movement at Berkeley. Now Berkeley is probably the most hostile campus to free speech in the country. But the free speech movement sprung up there. Why? Because the libs at Berkeley believed that we ought to say anything that we want? No, it's because they wanted to say what they wanted to say, which was being suppressed. And now they're suppressing what we want to say and settling standards and taboos, which are inevitable on their own grounds. Uh, so I think it, it's a 
not only am I making the prescriptive statement that we should not have an uh, open society, but I'm making the descriptive statement that we cannot. Society necessarily entails limits. It always has, it always will. That has certainly been true even in the United States of America, especially here, actually, at various points. Can all cultures cancel. In the 50s, you'd be canceled for being a communist. Today, you will be canceled for not being a communist. And frankly, I think the first way was better. <laughs> This, uh, again, is uh, something that conservatives have been thinking about since the beginning of the post-war uh, movement. And uh, you alluded to Bill Buckley's uh, view of the open society, his very critical view of it. And it seems to me that actually uh, there's a good chance that derives from Wilmore Kendall. Kendall was one of Buckley's professors at Yale. Uh, and uh, Wilmore Kendall confronted this idea that Karl Popper had presented. Uh, Popper's book is known as The Open Society and Its Enemies. And uh, Wilmore Kendall said no. In fact, uh, just as Michael Knowles has spelled out, uh, that any society is going to have its, its public orthodoxies. And there are going to be certain things that a society will just will not allow to be questioned. Uh, Kendall thought this was right, good, necessary if you're going to have any kind of political order. And that uh, the question was then, are you going to choose you know, good things or bad things to have as your public orthodoxy. So this is something that's been hotly debated uh, on the American right, uh, going back to the days of Bill Buckley and, and Wilmore Kendall. I want to turn to Stephanie, though, and just ask, um, do you see some rays of hope uh, on the right? Because I know you have you know, reservations about the direction that uh, the American right is moving in right now. Uh, you see you know, a kind of infiltration of some of the ideas of Carl Schmitt, or perhaps you know, uh, at, a, at a less uh, frightening level, uh, simply adrift towards the use of active government power in ways that uh, you object to. Um, are there signs that um, you know, there may be parts of the con uh, conservative movement or parts of you know, the non-left, however one wants to describe it, which do recognize uh, you know, the, the need for the understanding of liberty that you have and that would like to promote and extend it? Well, I certainly think it's an open debate right now. I mean, this is a live, this is a live question. And what the future of the American right will look like is entirely up to... I mean, the people who are going to live through it. So I'll be curious to talk to some of the young people who are here today and hear what they have, you know, in order to answer this question. I don't know how optimistic I am, but I, I don't believe that it's settled one way or another. But I would really like to just offer an alternative answer to the question that you gave to Michael, if that's OK. I'll, I'll try to be really quick. Um, there is another at least piece of this story, I believe, which is, and this is an example of um, culture being downstream of politics. So it's not the case that I just think that you have culture and then politics results from it. Um, I think the coercive power of the state can really do a lot of damage to the culture, and in fact has in the last century. And one of the ways it has done that is by centralizing, uh, nationalizing the sense that we are not responsible for each other, and we're not responsible, f you know, not just we're not responsible for ourselves, but we're not responsible for each other because Washington is responsible for them, for your problems. If you have a problem, talk to the, talk to the government. The government will solve it. So going back to the New Deal and the war on poverty and um, an endless parade of government programs passed with the best of intentions to try to help people, people in need. Um, we eroded the idea that we are responsible for solving the problems in our communities, that we are responsible for each other. Um, and we crowded out the private uh, mechanisms and institutions that would go about trying to solve those problems. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a real thing that has happened over the last century and that we are, so when, we, when you ask like what went wrong with the culture, at least part of the story I think has to be the way that the state made it much more difficult for us to be virtuous and to be good people and to pursue the good life and the good society. So let's take some questions from the audience. We'd like to have uh, you try to stump our panel of experts. We do have microphones here, so please come up. I see that Nigel Ashford has a question, so uh, we'll have him come to the microphone and uh, fire away. Yes, I'm Nigel Ashford with the Institute of Humane Studies at George Mason University. My question is on the 1776 Commission, and it's addressed to anybody on the panel who wants to, to comment. Is it a legitimate role of the federal government to write an official history of the United States? <laughs> well, it wasn't an official history of the United States. I mean, if you read it, it's not very long. It's not an official history of the United States. Whether it is or is not a legitimate role, I will say that every department in the United States government writes their own official histories, including the, the military writes histories of, of its wars. Each service branch writes histories of their parts of the campaign. The State Department writes a diplomatic history of the United States. Even the CIA writes a secret history of intelligence operations of the United States. So. If it isn't legitimate, we have a lot of work to do for pulling out those roots and defunding them and stopping them from doing that. In any event, the 1776 Commission is, is report is not so much a history as a defense of the principles and, 
and, and to some extent a defense of the history without being a complete history against scurrilous attacks meant to delegitimize the country and to be just perfectly blunt, meant to make the vast majority of American citizens hate their country. Mm -hmm. That's what the 1619 Project was. That's what most, if nearly all university campuses pump out. It was almost completely unopposed uh, in, the, in the broader culture. There are attempts to uh, you know, fight it. You know, Encounter Books publishes some things. Regnery publishes some things. There are some good things out there, but they're drowned out 99 to 1, and I personally don't see any harm in having the imprimatur of the President of the United States and the federal government put out a 60-page report lending their prestige and, 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 and weight to it. It's still a drop in the bucket compared to what we're up against, but every drop counts. Kevin, apart from the uh, substance of the 1776 Commission report, um, do, would you agree with Michael that there is an appropriate place for the federal government to produce such a report? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that I as think, a maybe. I think asking private individuals to render their, to tender their opinion about a subject like this was perfectly appropriate. I don't think the federal government ought to pay for it, but that's a different issue. I, okay, we'll take the next question from Michael Maybach. Yes, thank you. Excellent panel, thank you. Um, I'm attracted to what Stephanie Slade just went through, which is the irony that the more we've centralized our government, the more people say, why aren't we united? <laughs> because we weren't meant to be united, we're communities. We had federalism, states, and localities. So is, uh, is the way forward improved if we try to return to federalism and given uh, the, the fact that the income tax goes to Washington and so much is, has been nationalized by the Supreme Court, for example, abortion, marriage, is it possible to return to a federalism uh, disaggregation which would allow this country to breathe a different way? You know, uh, I'll take a stab at that. Uh, building on some of, of what Mike has said, which is uh, the, the difference between our Constitution and our Constitution, <laughs> the difference between our uppercase C Constitution and our lowercase C Constitution, I think in the past week when some federal agency that many people may never have even heard of, OSHA, is now going to jab an experimental drug into your veins and, you, and they're going to do it through the proxy of your employer uh, you know, at, the, at the request of the President of the United States. I mean, that, that seems pretty <laughs> radically different from what we were taught in Schoolhouse Rock about the bill up on Capitol Hill. Uh, so I, I think it's important for conservatives to recognize the government that we are actually living in, you know, the, the, the regime under, the, the nature of the changed regime that we are actually living in. Uh, and the left has not only transformed that regime, but has, has uh, really manipulated it to great effect. And uh, I think conservatives have all too often buried our heads in the sand and tried to return to a bygone era that if it ever existed in the first place certainly does not now. Uh, so uh, much as I would answer on this issue of the, um, you know, going back to the time when we could have a drink with Tip O'Neill, uh, I, th I think the only way out is through and uh, to Stephanie's point she's absolutely right that the government has uh, in not only failed to encourage virtue for many of the recent decades but has actively encouraged vice and I think uh, the, the reason for that is not merely the procedural madness of trying to you know, do good and avoid evil, but also the substance of what the government has actually pushed. And in many cases, they are actively pushing things that are our vice. They're not just making mistakes, but they're actively corroding the country. And so if we want to return to a, a system of federalism and subsidiarity, which I would strongly uh, recommend and pursue, uh, I don't think we're going to do that by throwing up our hands and saying, you know, we're not... Only the left is going to use the government, but we certainly are not, and we are going to remain here pure and dignified. I think we're we are going to have to wield that power for the good, for justice, and, and to uh, transform the regime back or into something uh, that, that resembles a, a much saner political order. 